There is a broader list of operational decisions that are critical to attend to in this initial reorganization meeting that both serve to set your work in motion and remind people what the context is and the set of agreements and practices that you're committed to in your work going forward. Some of these are probably you know, easy to tick off and others will take some more intention and thought. So clearly designating when the regular meeting will be held and where it will be held. Along those lines, we strongly recommend that boards schedule an annual work session, often called a retreat, where the goals and more detailed work plans are developed. In addition, you're going to want to make sure everyone is clear about where meeting agendas will be posted, and I'll touch on a few more items about posting information, including minutes. Agreeing on the use of Robert's rules, discussing and agreeing on the code of ethics, and then identifying, discussing and identifying communication practices that will best serve the board, the community, uh, and the school itself. So finally, the board needs to designate the newspapers for publishing meetings in order to inform the electorate of the work of the board. So let's begin by looking at Robert's rules in some greater detail. All boards are required by law to operate under Robert's rules of order. Decisions being made must be preceded by a motion presenting what it is at, at uh, state to be decided. A second, meaning a second person agreeing that this is something we should discuss and decide upon. Ensuing deliberation, or often that's referred to as discussion, and finally a vote. So that's a structure that enables everybody at the table and anyone in the audience to understand what's being discussed, that it's important enough that two members of the board have endorsed it as a topic for discussion, and that there are clear procedural steps that lead to a vote so that the board and the community is informed uh, about the board's decision. There are a set of rules called Robert's Rules for small boards that are more informal. Now this is <clears throat> something boards with fewer than 12 members can consider. I want to walk you through the mechanics of Robert's Rules for Small Boards. Again, a more informal structure for board operations uh, that many of our small boards choose to employ. It is still important for a formal motion to be made so as to make sure everybody understands what is being discussed. It's both informative and helps provide focus. Uh, however, in this more informal style, a second on the motion is not required to take up discussion and eventually make a decision. Uh, again, the board chair serves in the function of facilitating discussion uh, until it appears that consensus has been reached. And then when it comes to the vote, uh, typically all members vote, the board chair included. The uh, important um, item to underscore here is that the board has a discussion and, and comes to a, a decision about using Robert's Rules for small boards, um, both because it gives everybody uh, the opportunity to understand the differences and endorsed, endorse the practice so everybody is operating from the same, same playbook. Let's take a look at the work of communicating the work of, this, of the board and the school system uh, as a responsibility of the board. It's important that the board identify a spokesperson for those external communications, uh, particularly in terms of responding to inquiries from the press and other interested parties. So that the board is on the same page and is sending a consistent message to their community. That brings me to want to remind you why is it important to communicate? Certainly there are times and places where you have to respond to inquiries, questions, suggestions. Uh, there are also a lot of opportunities for the board to inform and engage the community. And that's critical because we do ask our communities to support our work, ultimately uh, adopt uh, 
uh, and endorse a budget that funds the work of the school system. And so providing our community good information about what's happening in the school and bringing them into that discussion is a critical function of the board. Uh, I refer to it here as sharing the successes of students, staff, the school as a whole. That happens obviously through many kinds of programs and events that are already in the school calendar. Uh, and it can also be complemented by communications that go out in print or through electronic means, including video. Uh, in fact, video recordings have become more and more common uh, of even board meetings uh, to, to convey to the community more of what's happening at the board uh, with the board's work. So communications, uh, it's critical to be on the same page and to take that up as an important responsibility of the board's work. One of the other most um, common ways in which the board communicates with the community is through the public comment period. That's a required uh, element of the open meeting law uh, that uh, there is a time on each board and, and committee meeting agenda that enables members of the public to be heard. So it's a requirement and at the same time it's a delicate balance because a school board meeting, and this is the second <clears throat> uh, bullet on this page, a school board meeting is required to be a public meeting. However, it is not a meeting of the public. And I say this recognizing that the challenge of a local board um, who is you know, typically uh, connected to many, if not most, of the members of the community, certainly people that may choose to attend a meeting. Um, and while the board's primary charge is to conduct the governing work of the organization, uh, this piece of open meeting law is designed with the intention of keeping an open channel of communication with the community. Those two can sometimes be at odds with each other. There may be something that many people want to speak to um, that the board needs to figure out how do we navigate a situation where a lot of members of the community want to tell us their thoughts or ask us questions and at the same time obviously we have work of the organization to accomplish. So. Uh, two thoughts for you here. Typically, boards have a policy which provides guidance and structure for how to navigate public comment. We have a model policy for that purpose as well. And as I mentioned earlier, when I reference policy, I mean, policy really reflects the wisdom of those that have come before us. And so it's important to build off those, those that knowledge base and set of best practices. Uh, as it, at the second detail here is around practice, there are also a number of particular strategies that can be really helpful, particularly to the board chair in facilitating a, a situation where many people want to speak. And often, of course, it can be on a on a topic that um, you know people feel strongly about. And so, it's really critical to to be good listeners, to provide that avenue, and at the same time balance the need to accomplish the work of the organization. So that's one of the uh, most important uh, vehicles for communications that boards need to attend to and it's worth at the reorganization meeting discussing that so the full board understands the policy and practices and is able to support that work uh, going forward. We strongly encourage boards at an, on an annual basis, whether at the reorganization meeting or at the retreat or potentially somewhere else, to also step back and talk about who we are and how we want to conduct ourselves as a body. So three pieces of this. You, the, as a board, uh, your power rests in the body, not in the individual board member. And in that sense, it's very important to act within the scope of your official role. I've referenced here the chain of command as an illustration of what that, how that plays out. It's not uncommon for board members to be approached by members of the public who have an idea or a concern. And the chain of command is, again, a policy that is 
an important policy to be familiar with, particularly for new board members, for all board members, that really uh, reminds us all, okay, how does this organization work and how can and should we address concerns and ideas? Ideally, those concerns or ideas go to the source. So if someone's excited about a possibility, they could take their thoughts to that teacher, that principal, that superintendent who's involved, share their ideas. Similarly, if they have concerns about a situation that may have come up, it's best to deal with it at the point that it occurs. The chain of command is fundamentally the system we have to assure that concerns and ideas get considered thoughtfully and thoroughly. And so we have layers of responsibility that begin with the, the staff, the frontline staff member, the classroom teacher or other day-to-day uh, -day, uh, educator in the school who's supervised by the principal and in turn the principal is supervised by the superintendent. And that chain of command policy fundamentally says to direct people to the source of their concern or the place where they can best have their idea heard which means that the board sits at the end of that chain of command and, and doesn't get involved in communications around ideas or concerns uh, until they're fundamentally brought by staff through the superintendent for consideration. And that really is the, the way I'm trying to reinforce the idea of acting within the scope of your official role. It also helps clarify lines of communication particularly for members of the community and or staff. Upholding the highest ethical standards, we speak to that very specifically in the elements of the Code of Ethics that fulfill the statutory requirement that we have a policy which addresses a conflict of interest. Um, fundamentally, board members uh, uh, should not participate in something from which they have the potential to benefit. And so this code really asks people to think that through, to discuss it, and to be vigilant in paying attention to those potential and real conflict of interest, and often perceived conflicts of interest, and have a forum for discussing and addressing those, and if necessary, navigating those. And finally, the Code of Ethics speaks to the interaction among the board itself or your peers as board members. I think we've touched a bit on the constituents. I hope I've touched a bit on confidential confidentiality considerations through my description of the chain of command. The last piece is with respect to how board members interact with each other. And the phrase is something along the lines of uh, interacting respectfully and constructively with my peers. And I think that has to do with hearing out different points of view, discussing them constructively, and coming to a decision uh, that takes into consideration different points of view. So communication operates on many different levels and really needs to be a critical discussion and at the reorganization point as well as on an ongoing basis. A couple other reminders that we think are worth touching on at the reorganization stage are board development, meaning your own learning uh, through sessions like this, others that we provide, and obviously there are many other sources as well. Two pieces of the picture here, we strongly recommend that new board members make an opportunity to meet with the board chair and superintendent. That's often best facilitated if the chair and superintendent take that initiative. And then as a body, for the full board to discuss, discuss and coordinate their attendance, participation at board development activities throughout the year. Uh, boards uh, often go as far as to developing an annual plan that has a calendar of, event, of events and assigns individuals responsibilities based on that. Uh, obviously, we think of ourselves as a critical source of that information, uh, but I, I certainly think there are many other good sources. So board development, an important discussion to have at the outset to set an expectation and to use that experience to further the work of the board. And then finally, advocacy. Um, while your 
primary focus is typically on your own school, and for many people, they come to that work through their own children's experience. Um, we're all involved in advocating for the success of a public education system in our state. And so we think it's important to designate someone on the board as responsible for keeping the full board informed and engaged in the kinds of public policy discussions and decisions that impact all of us um, in the sense that they sh everybody should be informed, have an opportunity to discuss, and for that matter, an opportunity to provide their input into the process. So the VSBA does its part by providing a regular report during the legislative session, the education legislative report. When there are critical and time sensitive issues, we use a, a communication called the legislative alert. And again, those are to keep people informed and engaged and to, to elicit their input. And typically, we're asking people to contact their senators and representatives to communicate their point of view. And finally, on our board of directors, uh, our board of directors is made up of two representatives from each of the 11 regions that we've designated around the state. And one of their responsibilities is to provide communications to board chairs uh, in an effort to keep people informed and engaged in, again, these important public policy questions that come up for all boards. 